Let's talk about our relationship with food. To feed a global population that will add billions of people by 2050, we must grow 40% more than we do today. With existing land already tapped, how do we find the space? Matt Bernard, CEO of Plenty, will explore how indoor farming can make delicious, mind-blowing, sustainably grown food accessible to all by bringing agriculture near to the major, the hearts of major cities worldwide. So please welcome to the stage, Matt Bernard. So at Plenty, uh, we have been working towards two main, the two main pillars of our mission, which are around better human health and better planet health. And the way that we think we're going to get to that place uh, is by uh, doing two things. One is by fundamentally breaking the link between growing populations and rising incomes and the demands that those have historically placed on land and water. And the other, so that's efficiency. The other is flavor or pleasure. Uh, we think that eliminating the fundamental trade-off that exists when we grow outside, when we as people, as humanity, grow outside or in a greenhouse, there is a trade-off between scale or price and flavor or quality. Uh, and, and one way to think about that is think of a Michelin-starred restaurant and the farmers that serve that restaurant. Michelin-starred restaurants, particularly in Mediterranean climates, have access to the best produce, the best fruits and vegetables that exist on this planet. You will be hard-pressed to find a farmer that serves a Michelin-starred restaurant who is also serving the largest grocery stores of the world. So there's that fundamental tension between grocery store scale and Michelin star quality. And we believe it's essential to wipe that off the map if we want to drive healthier people and healthier planet outcomes uh, around the world. And so as, as we look at, um, at the food system and we look at what's, what's possible and what we're doing at Plenty, we think it's possible to win on every metric. In other, in other words, to improve our food system such that uh, we're better in just about every way you can think of. So, so that means food that tastes fundamentally better and different than what we're used to, relative to fruits and vegetables first. Uh, that means food that's more sustainable. So uh, out in the field or in the greenhouse, they are using roughly 100 times more water than we use in a plenty farm to produce the same exact crops. Or think about it this way, take a head of lettuce. It's gonna take about 15 gallons of water to produce that head of lettuce outside in the most efficient place to do it in the world. And we're using less than a fifth of a gallon to do the same thing in a plenty farm. Uh, we use less than 1% the land. Another way to think about that is on the same footprint or hectares, acres, however you think about unit of scale, uh, we grow anywhere from 100 to 400 times the amount that a field grows uh, on that same space over the course of a year. Uh, so th these are some of the ways that we can break that link between the demands that rising population and rising income place on our water and land systems. So, so there you have the sustainability or perpetual of the, of the food system, you have whether or not this food is Michelin star quality or what is traditionally known as grocery store quality. We want to bring the one to the other. Uh, and then pesticides. Uh, most people, including those who purchase produce for the largest grocery stores in the world, don't know or are not aware that organic produce still contains pesticides. They are just pesticides made with organic compounds. And you can probably think of organic compounds that you don't want in your body. Most of us have about 29 pesticides in our body at any given point in time. And so we had plenty because we're able to impose full control over the growing uh, environment. We are freed from having to use pesticides while growing at grocery store scale, which is something that is new in agriculture uh, to grow at grocery store scale without pesticides. So 
pesticide-free, it tastes better, it is, it, uh, it is more resource efficient, uh, it has more shelf life. We are growing fruits and vegetables with weeks of additional shelf life, and we'll talk about why, that, why that's important in a couple minutes. Uh, but if you can imagine, you know, no more slimy greens and no more squishy, gross uh, strawberries in your refrigerator, that's what we've been working on at Plenty, uh, and we'll talk about why in, in a little bit. And so, uh, so all of these things together say that uh, we believe that the, the, the future is very bright for our food system and better human health and planet health uh, as a result. So one of the reasons why this, this is happening now and has not happened until now is in part because technology is making this possible. So we've seen this before. Google, for example, uh, wins in part because of the scale of their data set that drives better outcomes through their algorithms. Two and a half years before Google was founded, data storage costs were 100 times greater than the day they were founded. So had they started three to four years earlier, there was no business there because the cost of data storage were prohibitive uh, relative to the business. So that technology commoditization was one of the things that allowed Google to exist in the first place. And then they built a series of technologies and a business around that uh, that gave them competitive moat and great service to the people who use Google. Uh, you see the same thing with Tesla, who the, the cost of energy storage was three times greater a few years before they were founded. Uh, I could go on and on. The uh, DNA sequencing, the same thing has happened over the last decade. Uh, Facebook couldn't exist without the smartphone, without the precipitous fall in mobile data uh, cost and the cost of data storage again. So at, at Plenty, we see similar effects. So we have been creating a series of technologies. We've been developing and building them uh, over, the over the last five years. Those are on top of technology commoditizations that are happening elsewhere. So when you bring the farm inside in order to impose full control, uh, you need to create light energy for the plants so the plants can, can, can grow. The diodes that make that possible uh, we are spending 1% today that we would have spent less than a decade ago to buy the same light capacity for a farm. That made what, is, what was cartoonish about seven, eight, nine years ago something that is now possible today. The same thing with IoT sensors, which were both not effective enough and too expensive only five years ago. Machine learning and artificial intelligence, which we are completely reliant upon, in order to drive the plant efficiency and productivity we need while optimizing for flavor, uh, that was both not effective enough five years ago and 100 times more expensive than it is today. So these are all examples along with cloud computing and others that enable uh, this form of agriculture to be something that is of today and of tomorrow uh, when it, was, it wasn't possible only a few years ago. And when you think about agriculture, agriculture is, is a you know, business like any other business where the more control you have over the business, the greater your odds to be successful. And this is a chart that McKinsey put together where they looked at dozens of industries and the rate of innovation and digitization of those industries over time. And agriculture is at the bottom there, right underneath construction. And this is not because farmers are bad business people. They are, in fact, fantastic business people, they just deal with an incredible amount of exogenous risk imposed on their business by an environment they don't control. Think about running a business with no roof and no control and what that would do to your odds of success. It makes that business exceptionally difficult, which means there's no risk budget left to spend on innovation. And so by bringing the farm inside, we enable a lot of that, that innovation. We enable an amount of control that allows us to solve for human pleasure and health, as opposed to needing to solve for thousands of miles in a truck and an uncontrolled environment. Uh, we get to just solve for pleasure. So this is very interesting. As we look around the, the world, uh, you see, similar to what uh, Tony was talking about before, where he said the future is already here, we also view things on a time continuum. The future's already here, it's just here in different amounts in different places in different communities around the world. And so as we see over time people's incomes rise, people tend to want the same things as their incomes rise. And they want, they want a diverse diet, they want to enjoy what they eat, they want it to be fun, they want to be healthier. 
This is what people want. And as they earn more money, they tend to solve for these things. And so at Plenty, we're working at driving the healthiest diet that is known in this world uh, farther and farther down the income levels. And there are many things that are necessary in order to do that. One of them is to make the nutrient-rich foods of our diet, which are fruits and vegetables, last longer. So we're talking about weeks of additional shelf life not days of additional shelf life, weeks of additional shelf life. And that's for a lot of different reasons. One is because we cut time and distance and trucks and planes and warehouses out of the picture. We also, there are a lot fewer handling steps uh, when, when food is grown this way. We stress the plants a lot less in the farm, which means they have more capacity for stress post-harvest. And, and, and the level of cold chain compliance or, or our ability to keep these crops within a certain range of temperatures is uh, far expanded beyond what is possible when growing in a uh, field or a greenhouse. So, uh, so that is what ends up uh, producing weeks of additional shelf life. Uh, and that is something that will meaningfully uh, increase accessibility to nutrient-rich foods in the form of fruits and vegetables around the world. Because if you can't afford to be throwing away what you have spent your hard-earned money on, then you don't buy fruits and vegetables. And you see this in the makeup. If you look at the receipts of people around the world and you associate it with their incomes, you see a much, much smaller percentage of the diet in the form of nutrient-rich foods, the lower you go in the income scales. And so uh, we believe that we're going to meaningfully increase access around the world merely by removing perishability from the purchase consideration. And as you can see here, even the, in the United States, uh, where we have California, which is the most prolific of all the fruit and vegetable growing regions of the world, uh, we still consume far under what the recommended daily allowance is. And that's in part, we believe, at plenty, because these foods are not fun to eat much of the time. Uh, you know, the, the, it's exhausted. It's already been on trucks and in warehouses for weeks. Uh, it has very, very little existence left, and most of the pleasure has been, uh, has been sucked out of it uh, by trucks and warehouses. And for that matter, by solving for a production environment outside or in a greenhouse that does not allow uh, you to solve for flavor, you are forced to solve for, hey, will I have a business next year? So let's solve for hardiness or a, uh, an, an ability to withstand anything the environment throws at it. That's why. Iceberg lettuce is such a popular crop. In consumer trials, turns out people don't love iceberg lettuce. No one is, is you know, rooting for iceberg lettuce. Uh, it doesn't have any flavor, it doesn't have any nutrition, but hey, that stuff grows and it doesn't matter what the environment throws at it. Uh, it's, it's, it gives the, the farmer the best chance of having a business next year. Uh, and so, you know, in a plenty farm, we get to solve for what people love uh, and that is going to drive, we believe, a much, much healthier diet because we get to make vegetables compete with snack food and fruit compete with desserts. And, and it frees people from you know, reaching for industrial flavors and, in, and industrial foods, packaged foods, uh, but rather reach for something that is craveable in the form of, uh, of, of healthy fruits and vegetables. So fruits and vegetables, uh, separate in your mind uh, the cereal grains and the oil seeds on one side, and which are largely protein and calorie crops, and then the nutrient-rich crops of fruits and vegetables on the other. Nutrient-rich crops, the fruits and vegetables of the world, are not as photo-efficient by a wide margin as compared to cereal grains and oil seeds. And so what they like is a lot of light and not much heat, which means they grow most efficiently in Mediterranean climates. There are only five of those in the world. Small parts of Australia, small parts of California, small parts of South Africa, a strip along the Chilean coastline, and the actual Mediterranean. California is the most prolific of all of these, which by having uh, an additional month and a half of growing season, uh, California is growing more tomatoes than any country in the world, more strawberries than any country in the world, and I could keep rattling off the stats but that's just because it's the most prolific of all the Mediterranean climates. We are out of Mediterranean climates. As you notice, there aren't many to start with, and we've tapped out that acreage. 
So with rising population, we have, we have 7.5 billion people today and rising incomes, we've recently moved about 3 billion people into the middle class who are expected to then shoot up through the middle class quickly over the next couple decades as their incomes rise. We don't have a way to serve that demand without either farming more marginal land, land that is less productive, or bringing to bear another mode of production in the food system. And so we believe that is, that is indoor agriculture that is going to help uh, unleash that capacity while also making the, the planet and people healthier at the same time. So uh, this is very impactful when you look at where people live. So look at that juxtaposition. The Mediterranean climates, people. Uh, most of the three billion that have been moved into the middle class are there in Asia where you see four and a half billion people out of our seven and a half billion. Uh, and where is that food going to come from? This is our supply chain today. This, this makes it look simple, by the way, compared to how it actually looks. But you've got f food traveling thousands of miles and weeks to get to where people live because the sun imposes costs. It imposes cost in where we grow, it imposes cost on when we grow, how long the growing season is, how long we need to store the food, which crops we can grow, which varieties we grow, whether or not they have any taste, whether there's any nutrition left in the crop by the time it gets to people. These are all trade-offs that the sun imposes, and so we're working to strip those constraints out of the food system at Plenty. So the Food and Agriculture Administration of the World Bank uh, calculates how many calories we need needed added to the food system uh, between now and 2050. We think 2050 is too long to think about. I have a hard time thinking about more than a couple years ahead myself. And uh, and as you, as, if we just look forward just 12 years, what that what that those calories imply is that we need a landmass the equivalent of India plus Pakistan devoted to ag that is not currently devoted to ag. And we don't have that kind of land mass available. You heard me talking about the Mediterranean uh, crops before. If you look at the Mediterranean climates of California as compared to the other regions of North America, an acre in California is 10 times more productive over the course of a year than anywhere else in North America, save a few places in Texas and Florida where they grow citrus trees. But 10 times, it's an order of magnitude more productivity from one acre to the next. And so we either have to go to far more marginal land and drive up the costs uh, uh, to our land, to our food, and to our water, uh, or we need to add another mode of production. This is a simplified version of what the food supply chain looks like today. And this is what we are working to do to that food system or that supply chain, which is to simplify it. Uh, we believe that this is one of the key ways that we, get, that we help to get people better food for less money, food that tastes better. Because why spend 30 to 45% of the value at shelf on trucks and distribution centers when the system can be far simpler and look more like that? So, so that's a part of the key here is that we don't, have a, we don't have a calorie problem in the world today so much as we have a calorie distribution problem and a nutrient problem. And so this is one of the ways to get perishable nutrients to people faster is to simplify the supply chain. So that is what we have been working at Plenty to do. Thank you all for taking the time to listen. Uh, I am honored and appreciate your time and attention. And uh, we look forward to, to seeing you all soon and getting you the best produce you've ever tasted uh, as soon as we can. Thank you.